Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilan. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I want to uh, thank you, Ilan, for having me. And I want to thank everyone who joined us uh, tonight. Um, we are from uh, my balcony. Usually we're doing, whenever I did webinars, usually I do it from uh, indoors. But for this specifically, I wanted to, to do it uh, outdoors. Maybe I should show you. We're on the balcony. We're facing south. And uh, I don't know if you guys can see, but there are lights over there. Um, and that's Ashkelon. We are literally on the southern end of Ashdod. And we can see the lights of Ashkelon. And during um, the operation, uh, as Ilan mentioned, we were able to hear also the, the booms, the, the hits between uh, the Iron Dome and uh, uh, the Qassam rockets of Hamas and the, the Islamic uh, Jihad rockets. Maybe I can even um, share, maybe Ilan, if I, I, was, I was able to share the screen, I might show uh, the people that were with us today uh, where exactly on the map I'm sitting so it will be easier for, um, for people to, to understand uh, what I'm talking about. So let me just try to share um, wh where it is here on Google Map. So you can see what I'm seeing. You can see Google Map. Yes. Great. So I'm, I'm sitting right here. It's called Tel Chai Boulevard in Ashdod. And if I'm zooming out slowly, you can start to see the, the sea. And you can see that this is like the southern end of Ashdod. And this is Ashdod. Um, by the way, because Ashdod is built like this, it says Rova, it's like actually a square neighborhood. So we actually have four zones of red alert. Usually most of the cities, whenever a rocket is designed or is aimed at the city, all the city's alarms go off. But in Ashdod, because we have such a good, you know, square grid kind of like um, uh, neighborhoods. So whenever there is a rocket that is aimed to go on this area, the alarm goes off. Whenever we have a rocket that's supposed to go on this area where we have the hospital, Asuta Hospital and other neighborhoods, this alarm goes off. And there is this area, which is mostly ultra Orthodox uh, live here. It's also a one alarm. And there is this area that is also one alarm. And there is one alarm for this area, which is the industrial area of Ashdod. So it's actually, they're trying to save because to, to not make you go to the bomb shelter when it's supposed to hit other parts of Ashdod. So let's go and see how close Ashdod is to Gaza. So this is where I am right now. And if you go a bit south, you see Nitsan and you go and you see here Ashkelon. And that's the lights that I just pointed out a seconds ago. And if we go to Ashkelon, you see Zikim and you see this kind of line. This is already the Gaza Strip. And you have here Bet Lahia, Bet Hanun, Jebali. And if we go down a bit, this is Gaza City. And this is the Strip. Let me see. And this is where I am. You see this here. This is the distance. It's approximately 40 kilometers or 26 miles uh, for the mile system. So this is usually where this northern part is where they shoot at Ashkelon. You see Ashkelon is very close. Um, and this is what we call Dostef Aza, the area around Gaza. You see Sderot, if you see Sderot, this is very close. You see Sderot here. And we, there's also a railway here. If I'm not mistaken, the rail goes like this. And that's why it's very dangerous to derail the Israel rail system, they stop usually when we have confrontation with Gaza because they can literally, they don't need rockets. They can use RPG or Kornet rockets, which they use. It's a Russian made rocket and they can literally hit it straight. Although there is a wall here of, um, that uh, protects the train. But when they shoot at uh, Netivot or Beersheva, they usually do it from here, from the center. And when they first, when everything started, they shot Jerusalem and it landed around here. So you see, it's also kind of like, it's kind of like the same distance to Tel Aviv, which was also, um, they had a few alarms during the last conflict and also the Asharon area, which is northern to Tel Aviv, which were also alarms. So this is just to tell you guys where um, I'm sitting and, and that's about it for me sharing the screen. Um, 
maybe I should uh, share Ilan, maybe I should share first of all um, to give you a, as Ilan mentioned I'm doing a lot of public policy pro-israel issues and a lot of stuff but maybe to share with you guys a lot of people ask me about maybe the personal or maybe day-to-day aspect so we had just to give the the numbers we had around 11 days 12 days of the operation it caught us by surprise right it started from Monday exactly to the Two weeks ago uh, with this whole uh, Sheikh Jarrah uh, issue which I don't think we'll have the time to get into that later on turned to a lot of riots in the Temple Mount um, during uh, one of the last days of, of Ramadan and from that it turned into rockets fires of Hamas towards Jerusalem and that started the whole operation. So we weren't ready. Usually sometimes it starts, I don't know, either we do some preemptive strike or anything, but people are more ready for it. This is like something that started from nothing and immediately it was an operation. Um, but from a personal perspective, this is, I think, the third time that I experienced uh, rockets in Ashdod. The last time was Protective Edge. I think it was 2014. And uh, before that, there was also Pillar of Defense. And so uh, I think in pillar of defense it was only few rockets and we didn't have iron dome in uh, the protective edge there were dozens of rockets and we did have iron dome and this time I'll tell you in general so there were approximately 4360 rockets that were shot uh, towards Israel from the Gaza Strip in 11 days give or so. Um, 90% out of them were shut down by uh, the Iron Dome. And you'll see the numbers I'll tell you about Ashdod, but I think if we didn't have the Iron Dome, there would be two options. Either this kind of, you know, rounds or conflict or, or mini war uh, would end it quickly, I think, or maybe quicker because the devastation that we would have here would be unthinkable. Uh, to think like when you see one rocket that hits because it's so heavy and because they put so many things in it, it literally hits very hard. Um, so I think if all those rockets would would have gotten to their target, which is just no target, just to try to hit civilians, it would be very like a lot of people would have died here, our neighbors and people. Uh, in Ashkelon, in the Otef Aza. Um, there's also an, a unique number that not a lot of people should know, know that around 680 rockets uh, failed to leave the Gaza Strip. So they were shot at the Gaza Strip, but they were failure. So they landed inside the Gaza Strip and you probably will never know how many people were hurt because of those uh, failures, Palestinians. But here in Ashdod, Uh, there were 253 rockets that were shot at Ashdod. Approximately 142 rockets actually were supposed to land inside the city. So whenever a rocket, that's also a lot of things that people are not aware. So we have a radar. The Iron Dome is rockets and radar. So when the radar detects that a rocket would land at the sea uh, or land east, uh, eastern, eastern to the city, to the city. so uh, there is no alarm. Okay, we hear the boom, but there is, def- there is no alarm. Uh, but that happens, as you saw, it, 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 like as I said, it happens more than 100 times. Um, but Iron Dome intercepted 135 of those rockets. So specifically to Ashdod. Uh, so imagine that we heard approximately 135 booms that are interceptions in the sky. And we heard approximately... 10 uh, rockets that landed, that fell on the houses, that fell in different areas of the city. So how was someone with like a family with kids, um, how, how does your day change? So first of all, there is no school, right? That's a very good decision on the first day. Okay, we don't send kids to school, although there are safe places uh, like bomb shelters or we call them a mud, it's like a, a safe room. inside some of those uh, schools, but they, we don't send the kids because it's hard to get the kids. Here it's uh, 30 seconds you have, and it's hard to get the kids 
very quickly to those kind of places. So no schools, no kindergarten. So both of my kids stayed uh, home. So you, nobody also, a lot of people don't go to work. They start to work from home like we did uh, during COVID. Israel is over uh, COVID, but that's uh, how we did it in the last 11 days. Um, and it's, it changes the, the way that you, you live. First of all, every motorcycle that goes by, you can hear maybe now a bus go by. Every motorcycle that goes by, you automatically jump. And it's not just you, it's also the kids. They are very aware of it. It's, it's becoming so crazy that, you know, we even have a water purifier that you can make, uh, you know, like hot drinks with it. And once in a while, that water purifies, um, you know, hit the water, hit the water. So it starts with this kind of noise that you start to think, wait, maybe it's an alarm. So it's really, that's one of the things that are very difficult for grownups and for kids. You literally, your heart goes, you know, you're like, oh, is it an alarm? Is it not? And, but the minute that you hear an alarm, you run to one of the, the rooms. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, a safe room, a bomb shelter inside the apartment. But people that don't have it, it's very problematic, especially with kids, because they, they shoot a lot at night. So every time, imagine that you have little kids, you need to take them out to the, uh, to the staircase, wake them up or take them and sit in the staircase while things are uh, and wait there for a few times. And you can do that like in Ashkelon, there were nights 10 times a night. And we had here nights like five times a night. So thankfully, because we have the safe room, so the kids were sleeping there instead of their room. So they kept on sleeping, but we all the time had to go in and out. And it's really, it made our nights really without any sleep. But also when you need to go out, a lot of people, you know, at war, you need to go out to buy some groceries. So how do you do it? So first of all, a lot of people here, they try to go after a few times that there are an alarms because that's the chances, okay, they... They had three alarms in the last hour. We had three alarms. So then you go to the grocery or you need to get something from somewhere or you need to, you know, visit uh, parents, etc. You go on that. But the unique, unique uh, thing that happens is that you get into the car, you turn off the radio, you open the windows. It's, li it's really surreal. I got to tell you, it's surreal because there's not a lot of people outside. And, um, and also you change the route. Like here, I don't know if you saw on the map, usually we go uh, along the coast. It's like one of our most uh, straight uh, roads, but the problem is there are villas close to that and you cannot get in, right? If they're a rocket attack, you need to get in somewhere. So everybody changed their route to go next to like buildings or places that you can run to. And it happens to me once in this uh, cycle, I had to go to uh, a restaurant. One of my family had uh, some event in the restaurant. And in that drive, I got caught three times in an alarm. And one time I didn't have anywhere to go. So literally the first time it was okay. I got into like this kind of lobby of a building. But the other times I was just like getting out of the car and just going and just lying on the floor. Um, and it's really, I feel like it's really surreal because, you know, you hear and you'll study about being bombarded, you know, about uh, World War II, what happened in London. And you hear about, I don't know, Pearl Harbor and you see the movies and everything. And you think, wow, it's so crazy. How, how does it feel when you're like being attacked and you have nothing to do? And it's crazy to me to feel that I felt it already three times. Like literally, it's not like when I was in the army, you have weapon, you have something to protect yourself with. No, nothing. You're like, you know, without the Iron Dome, you're like sitting there like, like a sitting duck. And to have to think the kids need to go through it, it's also kind of, um, kind of scary. But that's the, main, that's the main thing that we had. Like we literally stayed at home most of the time. And every time was an alarm, we ran to the, to the bomb shelter. We came back. And I think in general, that's why I think Israelis wanted to let the IDF um, um, reach their goal in this because um, 
it's really hard to think that we're going to have it like in the next five years or so. Um, and because of Iron Dome, I think a lot of people felt, despite what I said, a lot of people felt protected because in the end of the day, when you get shot at uh, more than 4,000 times, 4,300 4, times, and still, um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, 11 Israelis and I think two more or three more uh, foreign citizens uh, died, I still think that this is um, a remarkable. It, like, I think a lot of people expected the Iron Dome not to work that well. Um, and it's, it, it was really remarkable. And we, we hope that in the end of the day, the, the IDF will get a result that it would not, we will not need to be in this kind of cycle of fourth time. Um, so that's about the personal feeling. Ilan, if you want to ask me something more specific, I'm happy to, to answer. We drafted a few questions for you, Noor, and uh, the first okay. question would be that some people argue that the Iron Dome, that again, it saved uh, probably thousands of lives, at some points might be given a false sense of security to the people of Israel, not allowing the army to attack in the front. So the fighting is moving from the front lines into the Israeli cities as Israeli civilians are being attacked. What can you yeah. say about it? And we also hear that the, the president uh, currently said that the United States will restock the uh, Iron Dome rockets and will allow the Iron Dome rockets to be quickly um, put back in spot in case anything else will happen. So what do you have to say about it? Yeah, so uh, first I want to say something about what the president said. So we all heard it, um, I heard it live also. It's important to say that I don't think we had a shortage of Iron Dome missiles. Um, and also based on my knowledge, the Iron Dome was mainly, the my knowledge, the Iron Dome is like 100% um, like manufactured uh, in Israel, but I, I did hear him saying that he will, uh, like the United States will support Israel by uh, sending more uh, Iron Dome missiles, but based on my knowledge, like it's, it's, it's made here. Um, but about, about, the, about the question about, is it because we have the Iron Dome, so um, the fight goes more um, to the citizens and, you know, in, in, we didn't have the Iron Dome, the IDF would definitely go inside the Gaza Strip earlier and, you know, maybe it would end earlier. I don't think so. I think it's, and we didn't have uh, the Iron Dome, definitely not in this kind of capacity. I think we didn't have it totally. And it didn't matter that much. I think actually the Iron Dome, it, it's true that uh, the IDF would definitely make a uh, quicker like land uh, operation, um, ground operation quicker. But I think in the end of the day, that would made uh, more Israeli soldiers um, getting hit and maybe even more uh, civilians. Because the minute that you go in, you're kind of leaving, it's easier to go behind you. It creates more, you know, it's like a, an operation. You're focused on different things. I think actually because the Iron Dome was so good, uh, it allowed Israel to sustain uh, those kind of hits and allowed uh, civilians here to, to stay resilient and to say, um, you know, we want this, to, we want the IDF to reach its goals and we can continue with this until... Uh, they reach its goals and it was amazing to see sometimes like people in the road which you know i think they had on the average an alarm for like every half an hour or every an hour they were saying and i think if there were i don't know hundreds of houses ruined in the road which is not the case they would have harder time uh saying it so i think it it adds a lot of uh resilience and um it's it gives it gives um both the military force more space to act and it also gives i think the diplomatic and the government more space to act because when we think about it also when a government sustains a lot of uh, casualties especially when it's um uh, when it's civilian when it's kids or something like that there is a lot of pressure to to put an end to it and sometimes 
you know, when you have pressure to put an end to it, you either decide to go in, go deeper in it, or you decide to, you know, we need to put a stop to it. Um, but definitely, I think the Iron Dome is a, is a game changer. I, I know that seven months ago, that's also important for people that are in the States, uh, Israel actually sold Iron Dome to the United States. Of course, it was some kind of like, you know, it's not like with full amount, but I think based on what I know, that the United States is, is going to put Iron Dome in every like foreign uh, base that the United States has. Um, and it's amazing to think it's not like there are um, those kind of system, but mostly for like heavy rockets, you know, the Patriot system uh, and mm -hmm. other system, but something like that with such a high percentage and such a good mm -hmm. record, uh, it's unique in the world. And uh, I hope you guys won't uh, be able to experience it, but once you see it up in the sky, it's really, it's like, it's crazy. It's literally crazy. You see one rocket comes. You don't see the Hamas rockets. You see, just see our rockets. You probably saw it on videos. But the idea that you see a rocket like literally chasing uh, another rocket and like during the night and it's really an amazing development and we're thankful for it because it's really saved a lot of a lot of lives. So mm -hmm. I think I think we're better off with it. Yeah. So some other questions that we might have is that we've seen many news anchors, agencies, celebrities, um, activists, yeah. and so on, uh, again, accusing Israel in a disproportionate response to the rocket attack from Gaza. We've seen celebrities like uh, Gigi Hadid and Bel Hadid that has over 80 million followers on uh, Instagram, um, spreading hate, inciting towards hate uh, on the social media platforms that they have. And by the way, just for a point of reference, there's 14 million Jewish people in the world. And those celebrities, Gigi Hadid and Bella, have 82 million followers, five, six times yeah. more than Jews around the world. Now, all of that, of course, led to tremendous amount of anti-Semitic incidents all over the world. We've seen cars driving in the UK, chanting that, uh, I don't want to repeat what they were chanting, but some really horrible uh, chants. We've seen that the uh, Jewish and people were attacked in restaurants in Los Angeles while eating sushi and been asked to identify as Jews. So can you reflect a little bit, first of all, about the claim that Israel gives a, or does a disproportionate response? And the second part, is, can you give us your opinion about what is going on in the court of public opinion or so on when it comes down to Israel? And also what do Israeli citizens feel about it what is, what is the talk at home okay so uh about the disproportionality it's not the first time that uh, it was uh, it was said and raised it's a it's a known it's a known uh, argument uh, against us uh, specifically when it comes to to gaza uh, i think it was also an argument also when it came to hezbollah and uh, you know beirut uh, both in the first lebanon war and also the second lebanon mm -hmm. war and I think it's uh, the, the people who argue it, if, like on one hand, I, I think what I, I can say to that, but in the end of the day, um, they literally ask us to be equal to our detractors. Like they, they, they actually say, look, Hamas is not as strong and you guys are strong. And I think, okay, so what, what do you guys want us to be? So you want us to turn off Iron Dome so we would be equal? Literally, like, would, and I think, and I think, and I think they, oh, I hear myself in the repeat. Okay, yeah. And I think, and I think uh, that's kind of like their, their argument underneath it. If we peel it, if we peel it, if we peel it, they want an equal war because when things are not equal, it doesn't look good for them. It's not pro like proportionality actually means it's like if they shoot rocket, you shoot one rocket. That's when it comes to, that's what, uh, what they're actually saying. So it's very hard to answer because I think that people talk about proportionality. They already have something uh, against us because they prefer that we would not be strong against uh, the people that are enemies. And I think if you ask um, John Oliver, if you ask if he, he wants, um, he now lives in the States, although he's, uh, he's British, but if he, 
if he wants the British to be equal to ISIS, because when the UK was part of a coalition that bombed ISIS, it was so uneven and unproportional unproportion uh, compared to what ISIS did, he would never say that, right? He would never say that. Uh, but when it comes to the only Jewish state, this is like an argument suddenly. And again, it's not like an argument that started right now. It started a um, long time before. And I think that we as pro-Israel, we should not be shy by saying that, you know what, actually asking for proportionality is asking for Israel to be, uh, to be weaker. That's what they're actually asking. Uh, and we have been weak in the past, the Jewish people and Israel. Um, and despite the odds, we won. So we understood that we need to be, to have the better odds. And we should not be, um, we should not feel sorry for it. We should definitely not feel sorry for it. Um, and also when they talk about proportionality, I think that if, if they take the amount of, of rocket that they fired at us compared to the amounts of uh, missiles that we fired at them, if that's proportionality, it's kind of like the same. It's almost the same number. The difference is that we worked hard and paid for precision, um, precision weapons to, to hit as precise as we possibly can. It's important to also say that, that I, I think in protective edge, more than 2000 Palestinians uh, uh, have died. We don't know how many of them were civilians that had nothing to do and died in the line of fire. And some of them are, are terrorists. Until this day, we don't know. Like we're already like four days after the, the operation. We know that approximately 225, 250 Palestinians have died. We don't know how many of them were terrorists and how many of them were not. In the numbers of the health ministry in Gaza, which is Hamas health ministry, it's important to say it also, they only say how many children and how many women, because why? because this is how they want to attract the, the attention of the world. What about all those men? Are all those men a terrorist or are all those men are non, you know, they are the citizens. They will never tell us. Um, and that's also uh, a problem. So that's about proportionality. We can't really say, but I think that if we had uh, 200 dead, those people, would still say it's I, it's not proportional because we devastate we like took down a lot of buildings in Gaza and they didn't. So I think it's like when somebody is hitting on that argument, I think we should go on offense and not to explain like what's the proportionality because I think there is something in that base of that argument that is wants uh, wants us to be even. Although we work so hard for us to be safe, which means that you don't need to be even. Um, you know it in the United States, people in the Western, Western Europe, that's actually the whole idea of, of having peace is to be strong enough that people, you know, will have some deterrence from you, right? The United States has have peace for like decades around the world, but still has the greatest army. Why? Because actually the greatest army in the world actually increases the chances that you will have peace. So this disproportionality maybe guarantees peace. So that's in the case of disproportionality. I want to speak about the influencers. I think also this uh, specific uh, round of uh, this operation actually highlighted the importance of influencers in the current days. Uh, I don't remember it being like this in, um, in um, a Protective Edge. During Protective Edge, I worked for Israel's mission to the UN. So I was in New York. And I don't remember uh, influencers being such a, an important, playing such an important role. Bella and Gigi Hadid, uh, as some of you know, their, their father is from Nazareth, uh, an Arab Israeli. Uh, maybe he left a bit earlier, so he might be like just a, pa a Palestinian. So they have a close uh, relations to, to our conflict. Um, but definitely this, this conflict, specific conflict highlighted, I feel like how influencers are very important. So if any of you work for like some organizations, uh, I think it's important to create more contact with influencers because they've they had a lot of uh, effect and I think they will have uh, more effect on political issues. Um, 
But I also felt, and we felt it here in Israel, and I think this is a true win from the anti-Israel side, and it happens a lot, that um, the pro-Israel influencers were kind of um, shooting for the even kind of message, which is there are Palestinians and there are Israelis and, you know, both of them need peace and both of them need the recognition and, uh, you know, we, if you care about the human rights of the Palestinians, you should also care about the human rights of Israelis. And that was like the message that came from pro-Israel influencers, um, which is kind of like a middle message, if I might say. But the anti-Israel influencers came at the very anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian, mostly anti-Israel message. So usually when you have this, like a lot of people in the middle and a lot of people are anti-Israel. So even if you're like listening to both, you, you might land in the middle. So it was very hard for me uh, not to see really hardcore uh, like influencers that were strictly pro-Israel. Like literally the mirror of Bella and Gigi Hadid and, uh, and The Weeknd and all those uh, musicians and influencers that were hard anti-Israel. It was very hard to find hard pro-Israel. And I think it it shows of this kind of atmosphere, the progressive values atmosphere. It shows of an atmosphere that is really make things complicated for Israel. Because if you see the trend, you see where it's going. Um, and it's and it's hard because this is about like Gaza, you know, we we did like we left Gaza and it's it's really complicated for Israelis. It's like what else should we do? And they, they tell you, no, Gaza is still under blockade. And then we say, okay, so what do you want us to do to open the sea for them so they can import even bigger rockets? That's what they say they will do. You don't want us to believe them? Or you want us to give them in? Like we give, like, like uh, in, inside Gaza, they have, they have like, uh, you know, trucks going in with a lot of things. But definitely we will not allow them to go to, to get things inside that we think they're going to turn against us. But even without that, they turn things against us. Like the fact that they have hundreds of kilometers of tunnels under Gaza, you can only do that with a huge amount of cement. Uh, and the fact that most of the rockets that were shot at us are locally made. You know, some of them are from Iran probably, you know, smuggled through the border with Egypt. Some of them smuggled through the sea in some way, but most of them are locally manufactured in Gaza's like workshops. So they use everything, you know, that they, you give them. If you give them uh, metal, they just melt it and they use it for rockets. Um, so it's really complicated things for us of how, um, of how to, uh, to approach this issue, like how to improve. Um, I, I wanna say something about the, the anti-Semitic riots that we saw in you know, New York, in Los Angeles, in, in parts of Europe. Um, it's all over the news in Israel. You should, you should know that the Israelis really are, um, like we know that you are standing with us when we have hard time. You should know that Israelis look at those pictures and clips um, and some of us feel, you know, that's why we need Israel. That's exactly the reason. But on the other hand, we feel, we feel so bad because this, this all things come out, uh, because of the situation here. Um, but I think like when I see it, I think that in the end of the day, that's why I think like, like I would feel really bad for Jews that live in those countries, in this kind of situation, if there was no Israel. Um, like I, I saw there was a tweet today from uh, the president, right, from Biden, and uh, Boris Johnson tweeted right after that awful uh, clip from the UK, from London. And I think also I saw Pelosi tweeting uh, today. And I feel like um, they are also doing it for the Jewish community, but I feel like the fact that there is a strong Israel also, you know, they don't mention Israel in their tweets because it's a local thing, but definitely Israel is, is there. You know what I mean? It's like, so, so uh, those kind of cases help me understand how, how much the Jews abroad 
uh, help Israel and are important for Israel and how much we are important for the Jews abroad. And I hope, you know, all those people will get uh, what they deserve. Um, so yeah, that's about all the questions I hope I answered. Question in regards to it on the same topic is that in the past you served as an advisor to the Minnesota governor, Mark Dayton, and uh, you also worked for a Colorado congressman. And um, can you tell us how American politics has changed since the times that you worked out here, let it be in Washington, D.C. or in the Minnesota state yeah. capital until today, let it be in the state of Minnesota with Congress, a woman like Betty McCollum or Ilhan Omar or their allies like Kenneth Presley or AOC and so on. Can you tell us about the change within American politics from an outsider perspective? Yeah, so I, I was I was an uh, intern on the on the hill for a while, and I also was interning for the governor of Minnesota in Minnesota. So I got to see both types of American politics. Uh, but now a lot of people in Israel. So we all believe that it's very important that Israel would not be a partisan issue, right? Israel is like the like literally. If I go with the mic around this region, if I go north with the mic, if I go east, if I go south. And I ask people, what do you think about America? And I believe it has nothing to do with Israel. Like, I think even if you, there was no Israel, I think they would say a similar thing. I think we are like this kind of little place inside this crazy neighborhood that loves the United States, that loves the value that the United States church, that loves the people of the United States. Um, and feel this kind of common and shared uh, values and shared faith, I think. But sometimes it's also kind of like unique how in this whole world, you know, we have this kind of like the greatest, our, our best, our greatest allies, like the greatest country in the world, uh, the strongest country in the world. And, um, and that's why I think we need to be with, you know, there are Americans that are Democrats and there are Americans that are Republicans. And, um, and I think like the last election also showed it's like almost half and half, you know, sometimes. Um, so uh, we need it to be bipartisan, but we definitely see also from here, and I'm guessing also from there, we see this whole issue of the squad. And also we see it on a local level. You should know that we also see it on like local um, legislators, um, I don't know if ever, any, a lot of people know, but there is a lot of um, anti-Israel organization that really got really hard in the last two, three years. They got really hard into this whole lobby thing. So they, most of them were 501c3 and they also opened the 501c4. I can give you like their names, like JVP. They opened JVP Action. Uh, American Muslims for Palestine, AMP. They also have a 501c4. And there's a lot of other organizations and they literally, you know, Betty McCollum, it's like one of her, they, they visit her every time. So they have, they have Betty McCollum and they have Ilhan Omar, obviously, and they have Rashida Tlaib and they, and, um, and, and I think at some moment they didn't have AOC. Literally, I, I don't think like, I remember her interview and people were questioning about her and she said something, yeah. And then when you, the, the interviewer pressed her, she said, I'm not, uh, I'm not a big on, on you know, on uh, global policy, geopolitics. And I think we should definitely put um, like the pro-Israel side, you know, there's APAC, there's others, but also people that are watching right now, we should put an effort on the democratic side um, showing those people. I mean, I don't think Rashida Tlaib or Ilhan Omar, there's anything to go there, but I really think we should, we should show those people like, like who, who are they supposed to support? Even if you're, you're thinking, okay, the Palestinians should have their own state. Okay, but in a conflict between Gaza, between Hamas and Israel, you can be empathetic to the people in Gaza. They didn't ask for it. You know, they're afraid of their government, but you still can say who's, who's, who's on the right side with, with your values. You know, it's, it's crazy for me. I don't know if you guys know, but in Gaza, there are no uh, men and women uh, barbershop. Like it's, it's divided. In Gaza, if you're a woman, you cannot ride your bike. 
literally bicycle. You cannot ride bicycle if you're a woman. It's like, you know, it's like we're talking about fundamentalist, extremist Islamic rule that think that Jews should not be in this region of the world and think the worst of it. So even if you're saying something about, you know, human rights in Gaza, and maybe you should say also about human rights in Israel, you should still say that in the geopolitics, uh, or, or my understanding, there is a side that is, is doing what America would have done, you know? And for me, when I see AOC, when she tweets, you know, uh, apartheid is, are not democracy, and she tweeted during the operation, right? She would not tweet it, I think, otherwise. It's like literally she's siding with those people that would not let her go if she would live there. They would not let her go with her hair like this. You know, it's like, it's crazy. I saw a picture uh, during the operation. It was a very funny, but really true picture. I saw like uh, queers for Palestine and somebody like people with the sign and somebody under it put like, I don't know, chickens for uh, KFC, you know? And it's, that's what we feel here in Israel. I mean, in the end of the day, we live in a society that is open, that, you know, wants to have, you know, women take full part of society that believe in the right of protest, that even if we have some, you know, things that are wrong, and it happens in liberal democracies, but the idea of it, it's something that it, it blows my mind when I see those people that are supposed to be progressive, supporting regressive regimes and ideas it's like it's it's crazy and i really think ilan to 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 your question i really think that the pro-israel community uh in the united states and around the world should do something about it should decide should 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 hit that right on the nail you know israel is a progressive cause it doesn't make sense to say that those crazy crazy i'm not talking about the people but the regime those crazy people you know that don't believe in freedom don't believe in freedom it comes like number 10 in their list they are progressive they don't believe in the idea of liberty they don't believe in the idea of freedom of speech they they don't have it you know written down those are your progressive uh, you know beacon that you want to go after so we need to do something about it because in the end of the day, what I feel is those people are gaining more power in the Democratic Party. And we don't have the luxury to say, you know what, we should just you know, forget about them because I know American politics quite well. And I don't, I don't remember there were uh, a Republican president for like, I don't know, 24 years in a row, right? So in the end of the day, Okay, it's eight years, then four, then eight, then another eight. It changes. So we need to have a stronger, um, stronger connection with, with, I think, this, uh, this kind of section in that party, because I think this section is like the future of that party. Um, and I think it's also very visual when you see a president that is, you know, as in his uh, late 70s, and you see all those uh, young representatives in their early 30s or their late 20s even, um, you know, in the end of the day, they, they will become senators. They get so much uh, attention. How many, how many people here can tell the name of a representative from New York? Not a lot of people, but we know one. So she might be a senator one day and she might be a senator one day and maybe she'll, they'll be secretaries one day. And maybe not them, maybe people who look up to them. So I think we really need to do it because in the end of the day, um, it's really our, like, I've been at the UN, I've been at the Security Council. Uh, we don't have other friends there. Not the UK, not France. They're not our friends in, in the Security Council. Maybe outside there are friends, but in the Security Council, they are not. And we need the United States of America and... Uh, so that's an important thing to look to look for. No, I will uh, keep pivoting a little bit to the situation yeah. that took place in the side of Israel. Uh, in the past 11 days, we have seen some uh, horrible pictures that uh, I don't remember seeing ever before of uh, some serious fighting between Israel, 
a, a Jewish uh, resident of the city of Lod was uh, killed from a, a lynching attempt by uh, Israeli Arabs in the city. In the city of Akko, Jewish businesses were burned down, synagogues were burned down in Ramne. In Jerusalem, there was a lynching attempt as well. And what can you talk about that a little bit of what, what have happened there? Yeah, sure. So this is actually, um, I don't know how much it's uh, it's covered. Like I know those news are covered, but this is actually one of the goals of Hamas. So people should be aware that Hamas is aware that starting a war with us from Gaza alone is not enough. So they tried based on, you know, intel that I get privately, but also others that they try to also uh, mobilize their operatives in the West Bank and also create a lot of problems within Israel. And also there were a few rocket shots from uh, Lebanon. It was mostly Palestinians uh, that, shoot, that shot those rockets and the Hezbollah let them. That's based on what we know. So it's, it's definitely a goal uh, from a Hamas point of view because then Israel is on multiple fronts and that's a really harder um, kind of thing to, to, to take control of. Uh, so it's true mostly in the, in, the, in the cities where Arabs and Jews live together. So in, uh, in Jaffa, in, uh, in Akko, in Tiberia, uh, there were a lot of, a lot of uh, fightings. Most of the fighting started from uh, Arab Israelis. But the second day, there was one incident that a lot of uh, Jews, most of them are not from uh, Batyam. They also attacked an Arab Israeli, and we were all amazed and were saddened by to see those uh, those, those videos. Um, so it definitely created a fracture uh, within Israeli society. I can tell you that a lot of people here, um, you know, we today I ate shawarma for lunch. The guys who were made me made me the shawarma, and the owners they are all Arab Israelis, and most of us have no issues. But there are specific places that today. Let's say in Jaffa, where there's a lot of Israelis would go and buy uh, there or, you know, eat there. Um, a lot of a lot of Jewish Israelis feel not comfortable to go, either physically uncomfortable, don't want to go there, or they kind of feel, OK, we try to improve our kind of coexistence and look at those people that, you know, in the end of the day, we see them as equal. Um, you know, equal rights citizen. They vote. They voted three times, four times already to the election, just like us. Um, and I think without this specific operation, we might have had like a minister that is like Arab, Muslim, Israeli. Um, so I think it's like, in a, I think in a sense, a lot of Israelis would be happy if the Arabs in Israel, the Arab Israelis, which we call Arab Israelis, but some of them call themselves Palestinian Israelis, which also raise a lot of things. Wait, are you with us or are you with them? Decide. So it's really a complicated um, kind of scenario. We would like, I think, for them to, to be part of the society. Um, a lot of people say, yeah, but they are not uh, Zionists, right? They, are, they can be Zionists. They don't want a uh, homeland for the Jews like the Jewish community wants. But then I think about ultra-Orthodox that live here and some of the Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox in Israel, they're also not Zionist. They might not be anti-Zionist, but they're definitely not Zionist. Uh, and they still live with us and we still want them to be part of society, to work with them and to, you know, live full life with them. So I hope, I hope um, this kind of, you know, uh, this kind of... Uh, I get, um... I hope this kind of this kind of tension will go down, and I hope things will get uh, better. But I I'm afraid it might take uh, a long time. I'm very thankful that uh, you know um, no one died in the hand like because of police because that's what happened in 2000, and that created a lot of tension between the Arab Israelis and the police. So um, so this time a Jewish Israeli died of a lynch and uh, a few others uh, were severely wounded in different locations, and also one Arab Israeli was, was hurt uh, during uh, one of those lynches. So I hope, I hope it, will not, uh, it will not happen again, but definitely I think that all Israelis realize that 
um, we can we can beat everyone. That's what we think, at least. Like we literally think that you know, if the day comes and Iran shoot rockets at us, and Hezbollah shoot rockets at us, and the Hamas shoot rockets at us, and maybe some will try to have like ground um, operation against us from Syria, from Lebanon. We believe we can we can hold it. We can hold it, and we can overturn it. Uh, but it will be very hard to overturn uh, internal conflict. Um, and I think it also, we usually think about it as like Jewish conflict, you know, the Haredis against the secular. Um, we all the time think about the time when the last kingdom of Israel uh, was destroyed was the time of internal fightings, not external fightings. But I consider this as well as an internal fight. Because in the end of the day, those people, the Arab Israelis, I think um, we can make them feel um, at home. I definitely think that if you take, again, if you look at the neighborhood that we live, I really think that if you go into their house and you interview them and you tell them you can go any place in the region, take your house, take all your belongings, you know, and start, start all over, they would never do that. Like, I really think they, they like to live in Israel. I think, um, um, I, I, I think they still have problems, but I think they still love to live in Israel, most of them. They, they, like, I've seen a lot of times when people like Israeli Arabs, when they're abroad, they say they're Israelis. Um, so I hope, I hope it will, I hope it will, uh, it will be better. So now we have a few more questions. Uh, a lot of questions actually come in, so we'll ask a few of them. Uh, right now no we're problem. in a ceasefire, and the ceasefire was announced last week. Uh, where do we go from here? Because we got an email here with a question of, yeah. do you think that Hamas is uh, going to gain a lot politically following this um, 11 days of operation and following the ceasefire? Does it look like Israel has lost? Or how does it look like who gains, who loses, who profits, who, loses who, gains. who doesn't? Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll tell you what I think. And what I think, I think it's mostly like the mainstream in Israel thing. So there are two levels of win and loss. I think in the conceptual level, like how people uh, think about it, I think that they had an edge. They had, um, they can, I don't want to say they won because I don't think they fully won. But I do think that if you look at points, like the way it was perceived, it was very helpful to their narrative. Because I think this was like the first time but I saw a lot of people in the West using apartheid and using this kind of like the delegitimization organizations around the world. They were pushing this kind of concept of Israel is, is, is an apartheid or Israel is like doing ethnic cleansing and all this kind of really nonsense and, and, and bullshit. It's, I'm sorry for the language, but it's definitely something that everybody who comes to Israel, you know, you could say a lot of things about the complication of, what happens in Judea and Samaria and here in Gaza, but to say that, that just actually to, I think it's to, to make people believe that we're like South Africa, that's their own goal. Um, and it's crazy to, that we were hunted because we are Jewish to say that now we think of ourselves as better than others. Um, so it's really, it's really crazy. Uh, but they they gained that support. They we saw John Oliver and saw Trevor Noah and we saw all those influencers that we mentioned, and we saw a lot of um, a lot of people in the West um, like picking on on this kind of uh, problem that is like cool to be anti-Israel. Um, so that's I think a win for them. I think what was better for us this time in this case was actually that we had a lot of diplomatic support. So the fact that we didn't do preemptive strike, that Hamas was the first one to shoot rockets, was actually seen by a lot of Westerns as he, they were responsible for the escalation. And we had a lot of credit uh, from like, um, like Western leaders, uh, including the, the US president. So I think that was good. Like Israel has a right to defend itself. It was something that a lot of people understood and said um, and I think it was good. I also think that what helped us this time that we really had more preci precision hits. Um, and although we took down some, some uh, high rises that some of them got uh, some criticism, I think that in general, 
we were able to show that this is really like we're trying to hit as much as possible like a uh, military target and about so that's about it so i think in like this kind of pr world hamas might have gained some points more than us um but about like real on the ground issues um i think it's like it's like we didn't we didn't agree to anything so when there was the ceasefire uh usually in the past hamas asked for some things when they got to ceasefire they said we will only cease the fire if you do da, 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 da. and it was part of like an unsigned agreement and this time we did not agree uh, to anything uh and now israel thinks about to change some of the things that we think led to this so uh hamas got uh 300 i think 300 million th- maybe 30 million or 300 million uh dollars every period of time from qatar and israel allowed it uh, they 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 the, those that money was supposed to go to like to the people in gaza and there were some kind of like you know mechanism to make sure that that would have happened and based on what we saw and the amount of rockets that they shot at us and everything we believe that they used a lot of it to their different you know drones and a lot of a lot of other things that they've done so now we think okay wait maybe we should do it we should give it to the palestinian authority and they should just wire it to the people in gaza and some things that i think hamas would not want um more things is that they say we say that now every time there is going to be like uh you know a terror kite or a terror balloon which is they just put helium inside a balloon and just have a, like a firebomb in the end and they just let the wind you know the wind in here is like from west to east from the from the sea so it goes straight to to israel so every time uh they will do that we will you know hit them very hard um well like really hard not just like you know equal proportional like really hit them hard so they would not do that even in the case of that turning into like a few days of fighting um so i think on that kind of case that the fact that israel want to change the rules of the game i think that already means that we feel that we've won because it's not like we're giving up anything we're actually changing what is already happened to our benefit but there are two different three different problems with that the first one is that um like it happens a few times in the last few years when hamas didn't get those literally suitcase with cash dollars they started doing those uh fire bombs um those uh you know uh terror balloons and stuff they started doing that then only when they got that money they stopped they like literally say we're going to stop but only give us that money we don't have money for our uh people and then they use that money for terror so we don't know how they're going to react right now and also there is kind of a problem of saying that every time they're going to fly a balloon or a kite we're going to respond very heavily because that gives a lot of power to stupid teenagers or to the islamic jihad so the islamic jihad is like kind of like um like the opposition in gaza sometimes um so when they are angry at hamas they would shoot rockets at us because what we do we're going to say hamas is in charge that's our uh, strategic way of thinking hamas is in charge of that enclave so whenever things happen there we put the we put responsibility on hamas so whenever the islamic jihad wants israel to shoot something at hamas they can shoot rockets and it happened in the past uh even um I think 2 years ago there was operation I think it was called Black Belt it was an operation that Israel decided to take out the northern uh commander of the Islamic Jihad because this guy I think it was called Bailata that's it was his name this guy was like going rogue he he wanted to shoot rockets even when Hamas told him not to um and he did that so what israel could have done so israel took him out and then we had like i don't know a few days of fighting only with islamic jihad hamas didn't even shoot one rocket just to show islamic jihad okay you you are going to handle it right now it's your fault so it's really hard to know how we're going to okay so now we know that islamic jihad shot the rocket what are we doing um so it's complicated but i do think that we have some strategic gains because i don't think hamas will want to go uh to an operation right now 
Like, I think Israel in the like next week or two would definitely not try to engage with anything just out of respect to, you know, Blinken, I think is supposed to land here. And, you know, Biden said he wants a ceasefire. So we don't want to do anything, uh, you know, to, to go against our friends. But I think in like uh, two weeks, three weeks, we, if anything was done to Israel, we would be very easily open to strike back very hard. And I think the people in Gaza, and I think also the leadership now that they see the devastation that they did to their um, you know, strategic uh, places, including the tunnels that they built, I think they also want time to regroup and see what they can do. So, so I, I think we might be better, but we thought that already three times. So maybe I'm mistaken. No worries. So now another question is that uh, sure. this whole operation in Gaza tried Israel also in the middle of a political crisis because that haven't been solved or haven't disappeared yet. Yeah. As we know that Israel uh, came after four rounds of election, still not able to form a coalition government. And now Yair Lapid has demanded to build a government. His mandate is going to be gone in about 10 days, I believe, or eight days. So eight days. what is happening on that front? Can Israel form a government, a functioning government that will serve the citizens of Israel? Oh, well, before we started this, uh, before this whole thing started, it was kind of cut clear that we're going to have a government. And it's actually will, without Benjamin Netanyahu. It was clear that uh, Bennett, Naftali Bennett, was supposed to be like the prime minister in the last, in the first one and a half years or so. And then it was supposed to be Yair Lapid. Uh, it was supposed to be the first time in a long time or first time ever that, no, first time in a long time, I think since the 90s, that an Arab party is supposed to, was supposed to support uh, the forming of the government. One vote without being taking part in that government. Um, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, there is a guy called Mansour Abbas, which is, he kind of quit from the United Arab uh, Party, uh, which was like the United Arab Party in the Israeli parliament of like four different factions. So he left and left, and there were three factions that stayed there. And he got like four mandates, if I'm not mistaken, and they got uh, five or six. So he literally took half of the power, although he took only his party. And the amazing thing is that he ran on the ticket of taking part of the government, uh, either directly or indirectly. He literally said to the voters, the Arab Israeli voters, look, they are promising you a lot of things, but because they don't, they are not willing to take part in a government. They all the time want to sit in the opposition. So they are not going to get you anything. So I want to do it. And the sad part that this was a very big leap forward for, I think, Arab Israelis. Like we, Jewish Israelis waited for this to happen. You know, it's like, yeah, come take part. Why you want us to, you know, budget your things, come and have a representative that does that for you. And he was like, he, he was first from a, like the local party called Ram is also like very highly affiliated with like the Muslim Brotherhood of Israel. That is, was like one of the most amazing things. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu said before the elections that he would not uh, form a government with his votes, uh, like with the votes of Ram. But when the, the results uh, came, he had to use the, those votes. But then who stopped him? It was actually a right-wing uh, a party, some would say extreme right-wing party that didn't want to form a government with the help of the votes from Ram, despite the nice words and kind of like things that uh, this Arab uh, leader, uh, Mansour Abbas, he, the, 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 the things that he said. So Netanyahu could not form a government. He would pass it to, uh, he passed it to Lapid. Uh, and then because Lapid could not really a former government by his own, he would need Naftali Bennett. So Naftali Bennett put uh, this kind of suggestion or kind of ultimatum that he will be the first uh, prime minister. But it was very tough for somebody like Naftali Bennett who comes from the Israeli right. He's supposed to be even more right than Benjamin Netanyahu, right? The Likud's supposed to be more center right. And he was supposed to be like literally hardcore 
uh, right for him to form a government with the help of those votes. And because of the conflict that just happened and mainly what happened between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews, um, he announced that he doesn't want to form this kind of government, um, probably from pressure from his own party because of what happened, because of the tension. Um, so now the number one thing that's supposed to happen is fifth election, um, which I don't know if anything would change. Maybe, you know, those kind of operations change how people think on one hand. On the other hand, we had like four times. So it's hard for people to move from one block to the other block. Um, another option that we, it seems kind of not that uh, good right now, maybe 50% or maybe even less, is that we're going to have a direct elections only for prime minister. In those elections, Benjamin Netanyahu will win for sure. Um, but the problem is it's such a big change of the way Israel is governed because the whole idea of a prime minister, a prime minister in Israel is like the head of the coalition and the coalition is like the majority in the Knesset. So that's why a prime minister can push for, legis for legislation, etc. But also that's why the opposition can, can, you know, say to, you know, take down a prime minister, right? Have a, have a vote of confidence. And if, if the government failed in this, then we go to election. So what do you do when you have a prime minister that was directly elected, but don't have a majority inside the parliament? So, so he cannot legislate? How can he work? So he will only have the executive power. It's really, he cannot do anything. So, so I think we're probably heading for fifth election where like, I'm like pro, my young kids already had like three, four election pictures, you know, with the, with the thing. So with the ballot, uh, so maybe things will change. I don't know. It's really kind of uh, a problem because it really looks that Israel is divided, but our mechanisms are still based on majority when where you're actually divided, it's a problem. So, so there is no super majority, so. No, or no, well go with the one more question and that would be our final question for today so sure. this uh, webinar is hosted by students supporting israel and clearly you've been involved with our organization since our first days uh, when we took our first steps uh, since that moment we grew students supporting israel is now operating in argentina in canada all over the united states we support students and campuses with ssi and without ssi so in order to keep fighting on our campuses for the public opinion, for the narrative, especially when it always feels for uh, to us like an uphill battle, you know, because college campuses are some of the most progressive places that you can possibly land in. But at the same time, as long as the conversation doesn't involve Jews, right? When it comes down to Jews yeah. and to Israel, those places become very far from being progressive. So what is your advice to the students, to the parents that have uh, students on colleges, uh, you've seen us growing in the past nine years, and what do you see us moving forward or doing or helping, or how do you see that fight is continuing? I think I think we should definitely put some effort, maybe twenty, maybe thirty uh, percent, to allies. Um, I think we kind of like Zionists and pro-Israel kind of like left this aside, but I think it's very important to be there. Uh, for other people's um, goals also. Because I really think that, um, so when you, when you combine our values with other people's values, it's, it's, it's gonna help our cause. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy for me that, you know, when you see, when you hear Martin Luther King and you hear how he spoke about Zionism and about Israel, and you see what's going on right now with Black Lives Matter, and how it's like completely hijacked by anti-Israel. And when you, when you see, you know, what, what our enemies, what they think about skin tone and what we have here with, you know, people that are, you know, from different kind of backgrounds, people that are brown, people that are, you know, Africans. Yeah, my, my dad was born in, uh, in Morocco and I have like one of my best friends, his dad was born in, in Ethiopia. And to think that, well, like we, we need to connect more uh, with people that are that are have 
other causes than ours that we support. Even if it's like on different campus, you know, in UCLA, they would be with, I don't know, with like uh, maybe actually with the organization that supports more, uh, more like uh, the police or more like, you know, more uh, kind of like law and order or more uh, the Republicans or more the Democrats. We need to have like allies and be there and attend, like literally SSI should attend other groups that we feel that they're our allies. Because uh, I feel sometimes that we want people to come to our cause, but we already kind of like left down other people's cause. And, you know, the other side has been doing that for a long time. I know it's very hard. I know it's like, I, I know it's tough. Okay, I've been there and I know it's tough, but I really think it's something that we should put a thought into it. And once you put a thought, that's like the first step of doing something. So I definitely think that we need to, to be and focus more on the allies project to bring other people to our cause and to go and help with their cause. Um, and the, the other thing I would also uh, put emphasis on, um, on social media. I think that we need more uh, chapters that are really like people like are following them very well uh that are they get a lot of uh, attract like a lot of traction i think in like when you look at a chapter when you look at what's happening on campus so there's a variety of things there are like events there's tabling there's what's happening on social media um and maybe there are some initiatives you know either like legislation the anti-semitism legislation or maybe some initiative of like adding a course adding a, a student uh, abroad program to israel so I really think that we should um, we should focus on all those, but maybe put a, more focus on creating allies and more focus on social media of of becoming better on on uh, on social media like our our adversaries have become. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, no, on that note, we know that it's almost 11 p.m. in Ashdod, Israel. So Correct. With that opportunity, we would like to really thank you for joining us today for sharing pleasure. your opinions with us and sharing your experiences with us. And we hope as a friend to the organization, as uh, we hope that you'll be safe. We hope that there will be no more fighting, hopefully not anytime soon. And we, of course, wish you and all the citizens of Israel a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ilan. Thank for everybody that was here with us and listened to us. And um, really good luck to SSI. It's an amazing organization with amazing force behind it uh, that was not existent, I think, between before 2012, 2013 and 12. Um, and I really hope that more people will support your work and they support the, the work of young people on campuses. It's, it's, it's the future. It's the future of the United States. And it's also the future of Israel. So I hope uh, you continue to succeed. Thank you, everyone. Some people in the chat uh, asked uh, for your content information in case for they have uh, more questions. So if you don't mind posting uh, some content information or how you would be able to, how can they reach? Yeah, sure. How can I'll write my email questions? I'll write my email. Okay. Share your email and I'll write it here. wait a few seconds so people can copy that before we hang up the call. No problem here. I'm writing it. That's my email. Awesome. So once again, and always is email in the chat right now. If anyone wants to reach out for more questions over email, uh, please use it, uh, bitonnaor at gmail.com. And once again, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. And in SSI, we'll keep doing what we do best, and it's fighting for the state of Israel on our college campuses. Have a good afternoon, and good night, Noor. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paul. Good night.